good morning. Um, before we begin, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Tiago and I'm a user experience designer. And for the last four years, I've been focusing mostly on UX, uh, specifically for financial services. I've worked with uh, Barclays, World Bank, American Express, and I'm currently working with Lloyds Bank. One of the greatest influences for my work were actually video games, partly because of the, uh, <coughs> the rich interactions and the immersive sound design and animations, but mostly because of the contrast between games and financial products. Games are fun, they're engaging, and they, have, they tend to have this vibe of playfulness and lightheartedness. Banking, on the other side, can be quite dry. It can be very dry, actually, and people are not usually that engaged with their finances, and financial services often feel very alienating to consumers. So I think there's a lot of product design wisdom to be learned from games, including Mortal Kombat X, and that's what we'll be talking about today. On a completely different note, about a month ago, my girlfriend and I became parents for the first time, which means I have not had a good night's sleep in a long, long time. So if at some point my mind goes blank, or I start stumbling on words, or inventing some new words on the spot, it's okay, just roll with it. Mortal Kombat. For, I guess most of you do know, do know about Mortal Kombat, but for those who don't know, I guess you probably guess by now, it's a fighting game. Um, I've been a massive fan of the franchise since Mortal Kombat 1 first came out about 24 years ago already. Uh, and last year, NetherRealm Studios released Mortal Kombat 10, or X. Now, apart from the amazing graphics and animation, there are two main differences between Mortal Kombat 1 and 10. First, 24 years ago, we probably all had a lot more time to play video games. I know I had. And second, nowadays when I do play, play games or watch gameplays on YouTube or Twitch, I find myself reviewing these games just as I would any other piece of software. Uh, trying to fish out any cool ideas that I can use on my own work and building these bridges in my mind between the gaming world and the fintech world. And today I'd like to talk to you guys about a couple of those ideas or lessons that banks can learn from more than one X. The first lesson is about customer engagement. Uh, NetRealm Studios, the current owners of Mortal Kombat franchise, they started building anticipation about their new game almost two years before they finally released it. Uh, they shared free beta versions of the game to whoever wanted to play it, not only creating an early appetite for the game, but also outsourcing tons of early free feedback from a very dedicated tester community, the gamers themselves. They showcased early versions of the game in Comic Cons and similar events, as well as online on social media and YouTube, even though some of the features might still be very buggy and incomplete. And when the game became more solid, they organized a live tournament, this one, the Fatal 8, as a promotional stunt and invited professional gamers, pretty much YouTube celebrities, uh, to have them discuss the design aspects and gameplay and fun factor of the game and its possibilities. Um, even after the game was released, NetherRealm Studios continues to provide for their customer base tirelessly, either with regular software updates to revise the, uh, the game mechanics or correct bugs, or with fresh new content, content to continuously reinvigorate the game. For instance, uh, shortly after the game was launched, NetherRealms announced their first combat pack, uh, four extra characters, and later a second combat pack. And the way they promote these new characters, essentially new features of an existing product, is quite ingenious. They leak some details on social media to to create suspense. And then they reveal the characters in these teaser videos, and again on YouTube and social media, and then they have video week, a weekly analysis of each of the characters, as well as interviews with the design teams responsible for them. So by the time each of the characters is available as a download, not only is the fan community extremely curious about them, but they're also extremely educated about them, because they've, they've had a chance to see them in action and see what they can do with them. If now we have a look at some of the customer engagement strategies behind the new mobile first challenger banks, you quickly notice many similarities in the way they design and promote their products. A good example would be Monzo. Uh, they were originally a prepaid debit card service that has been very recently been granted a banking service, a banking permit here in the UK. I was one of their early testers in January when their 
when they first made their app available as a private alpha release, uh, together with a few hundred other testers in the London area, we were willing to play with the app and the card and provide early feedback. And once the product became more solid, a public wide beta version of the app was made available in the App Store. Not only does their app include strong feedback mechanisms, you can, you can access forums, you can, you can send feedback and suggestions, suggest, uh, gonna, suggestions to the Monza team, or you can also request help quickly, uh, all from the app. But Monzo has also organized um, several hackathons, coding marathons, where customers and creatives are invited to collaborate and explore the Monzo banking platform, its APIs, and potential for integrating other features and services. Making the most of social media, Monzo has been very hard at work on keeping the growing fan base aware of their business and product development efforts either by regularly updating their blog or by teasing their audience with glimpses of up-and-coming features on social media. And recently, they did something I've pretty much never seen a bank do before. They publicly announced their entire roadmap for the next 18 months, or at least a glimpse of it. Uh, some of the features are very, you know, they're very standard banking services, which is to be expected because they want to become a fully fledged bank. But some of the, idea, some of the ideas were quite novel and useful. Uh, not to mention the transparency and accountability associated with this gesture, which is very common from a financial services company, particularly a bank. In fact, if we now have a look at the more traditional high-speed banking, you'll notice a much bigger contrast between the gaming industry and banking. Game design studios are proactive. They constantly challenge one another to come up with more engaging ideas and products to stand out from the crowd. Traditional banks, on the other hand, they operate in a much slower paced, complacent industry than the game studios. Uh, to give you guys some perspective, when Metro Bank uh, recently launched in 2010, they were the first new high street bank in the UK in over 150 years. There was no new banks for 150 years, no new competition. And often when a bank does improve one of its products, it's because they've been imposed to new legislation and were forced to evolve and become compliant with the new market regulations. Just like every other bank, and as a result, there's generally very little difference from one retail bank to another in, the, in terms of the services offered, which is possibly one of the reasons why people don't see the need to change banks that often. From a, technolog from a technological point of view, Game, game studios are also constantly striving to push the limits of existing technology and even create some new one of their own. While most banks are still struggling with their legacy IT, they have outdated mainframes and servers, which were designed to support classic bank branches, but nowadays feel severely underpowered for the modern internet. <coughs> and most importantly, for the topic we're discussing today, from a mindset point of view, while game studios are often known for their innovative thinking, and continuous response to market conditions and consumer feedback, banks are often perceived as stifled environments, stuck inside a corporate bubble that prevents them from seeing the actual amazing positive impact they could actually have in the world. Uh, but things are starting to change, uh, and we'll come back to this a bit later on. The second lesson I'd like to talk to you guys about is customization. Uh, NetRealm Studio Location provides you know, additional skins for the characters and you can, you can customize the gamepad configuration. But it was the concept of character variations that really caught my attention. In a nutshell, every character in Mortal Kombat X has a default set of moves. But they also come in three character variations, three different flavors, so to speak. Each one with a unique extra set of skills special moves or weapons exclusive to that variation. For instance, one variation might be very good at, uh, at, uh, at creating safe distance from the opponent, just attacking them from afar, while another variation might be very good at just spreading traps across the arena. Uh, now, when I started researching about the variation feature, in the beginning, I was wondering if these variations might actually be, might actually represent a series of personas, as in, maybe each variation was fine-tuned to a specific user profile and maybe there were three generic user profiles in fighting games. 
I couldn't actually confirm this theory, but it did make me wonder, what if we could have variations in banking? Maybe when using their banking app, the user could select a smart saver variation, which automatically moves money between savings accounts in order to constantly get the best interest rate. Or maybe a family map variation, which enabled the user with a set of tools to help them manage the, fa the family expenses together with their spouse and children, like parental controls or shared spending dashboards. The thing is, compared to character variations in some of the customization experiments in game design, personalized banking and personalized banking tools are very much still in its infancy. Many banks have a regular version and a business version of their websites, and some even have a, a wealth version targeted at the wealthier customers with a slightly different branding tone. But that's as deep as it gets. But maybe the use of character variations could be one solution to this design challenge. Maybe banks could provide the customer with a core set of financial tools and provide them with optional pre-configured feature packs best suited to their banking needs and profile. <coughs> uh, you could even allow them to switch on individual features, uh, plugins or add-ons. Notice that when I say features and add-ons, I'm referring to personalized, meaningful service not generic offers. Uh, most of the add-ons I see on banking apps and sites are loans, mortgages, and credit cards, which, fair enough, they are important financial products, but they focus predominantly on sales for the bank, not on helping customers develop sustainable financial wellness. The Barclays Feature Store is one such example. It's, it's a really nice idea, but as a product, you feel that it still needs a few more iterations. An alternative product design approach could be to allow these features to exist not aggregated into a single app, but available as a collection of interdependent apps, uh, each one focusing on a particular range of user needs, a portfolio of apps, so to speak, powered by banks, so and so. However, a word of caution here, this strategy works best if the customers see a relevant distinction between the various services offered, even if they do share a strong level of integration. People don't usually criticize Microsoft for having <coughs> separate apps for Word and Excel and PowerPoint, but I still hear people complain about having to use Facebook and Facebook Messenger as two separate apps. Likewise, people don't see much distinction between banking <coughs> and payments, which is why I also hear similar remarks about the Barclays mobile banking app and their Pingit app being two separate downloads. Uh, for those who don't know the Pingit app, it's pretty much a mobile wallet. It allows you to send quick payments between friends. But as, but as an example, imagine Barclays or Lloyd's or Monzo at some point had a solid online accounting service under their belt, like uh, Crunch.com, for instance. If when opening a business account with them, you were offered their accounting services as part of the package or as an extra service for a fee, many customers would probably see the, the value of having both their business banking and their business accounting provided under the same roof. A final word on this matter is always be very careful with the branding. I'm pretty sure these guys didn't anticipate it, but when I look at this screen, I see way too many blue eagles. It's just blue eagles everywhere. A third option, I'm doing a Steve Jobs thing as well, yeah, we have more than three. A third option I'm particularly excited about is called open banking. In a nutshell, open banking is banks enabling their customers' data to be securely shared by APIs with any service provider that holds a required license. Which ironically means that you're also empowering these service providers to develop new competitive products of their own. In plain English, this means, for instance, that if your, bank, if your bank's app is really, really bad, or if you don't have an app at all, you can still view your banking data, your transactional history, and make payments using a third-party app. Similar to how you can use your Gmail, either on the dedicated Gmail app or on the many mail apps available on the App Store, including the default one that comes with your iPhone. In fact, there's this new regulation called the PSD2, or Payment Service, Payment Services <coughs> Directive 2, 
which requires banks to update their IT infrastructure to become fully compliant with the system by 2018. Uh, some of these details are not yet final, but most likely the BSD2 will address current accounts, savings accounts, and credit cards, and very likely future iterations of BSD3, 4, and 5 will address even more financial products like loans and mortgages. For customers, these are great news because it means increased market competition, it means lower prices for services, and it means faster product iteration and deployment. For the high street banks, it can go both ways. Um, like I mentioned early, earlier, banks are heavily regulation driven on their product roadmaps. So yes, they will comply with the PSD2 eventually, but the more important question here is, will they see the bigger picture and upgrade their business mindset as well as their IT infrastructure and start seeing themselves more as a banking platform and less as a bank? If you look at Bar again at Barclays as an example, they seem to already have this Barclays developer network going on to help developers build the apps of tomorrow with their banking APIs. But, when you look closely at their API library, the only API they have is one that allows you to locate the nearest part of this branch, which is borderline useless. So again, like the feature store, the part of the developer network looks very nice in theory, but as a product, it still needs a few more iterations. On the other hand, when you look closely at some of the challenger banks, such as Monzo, these new banks are being designed from the ground up based on this marketplace, uh, based on this marketplace mindset. Monzo's, Monzo's agenda and product roadmap is very different from most banks. Instead of selling different of instead of sell, selling dozens of different financial products, they want to build one product. They want to build the best current account in the world and enable their customers access to the best products and services from across the market. So they pretty much want to play well with others. Want to send money overseas? Connect with TransferWise and let them handle the transaction. Savings accounts, not working out for you in terms of interest rates. Connect with Funding Circle or Zopa or RateSetter and use them as an investment platform. With open banking, suddenly as a consumer, you have a lot more options to make your banking experience a truly personal, a truly personal one so I customize to your needs and values. Now, Monzo is a very young company. They currently have about 50 people and they have very low operation costs and they have virtually no legacy IT problems, which gives them quite the, an advantage in the sense they are unusually nimble in the financial services arena. As a result, they can adapt to customer feedback and set a new course on its product strategy much quicker than most of its high street competitors. They also have a particular advantage, which is their vision of a better mobile first <coughs> bank. Their recognition that customer expectations and channels have changed tremendously in the last decade. And like I mentioned before, even if traditional banks are not overabundant in agility and consumer awareness, they more than compensate with their size and muscle, with the amount of capital they have, if they eventually overcome their outdated processes and their business ethos and they set themselves on the right track, which, as we've seen today, includes getting customers engaged and involved in the early stages of their product design and defining their product roadmap, focusing not just on sales but on meaningful service to the public, there's no telling how far they will actually go. The third lesson for today's presentation is, or would be, transparent conversations, but unfortunately we've run, we've, run, eh, we've run out of time today. On the bright side, this uh, presentation is part of a series of blog posts so where I explore the ideas in a bit more detail, so you can read them on the website. And uh, any questions, comments, Twitter, and I think we have a few minutes for QA. And thank you so much for listening.